What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over uh, round timers, rounds, and updating the character HUD to be a base game mode HUD, so all the information that we want to display for our game mode is there, such as the round timer I just mentioned, and character images for whatever character they are, and things like that. Let's go ahead and continue. We'll go ahead and play on Trail of the Wise. <laughs> Okay, so we got our two characters. You can see we have ready fight text. We have a lot more going on now. We have the character images that are next to the health bars that represent the character we are playing. We also have the text for the name of the character. And we have a round timer that goes down in the middle. So we have quite a bit that's going on here. I'm gonna smash this all into this one episode just because I think this kind of I think the HUD stuff does go with the game mode. You might not have all this in like story mode or something like that. So I think it's important if we're focusing on like game flow, round timers, that we have everything we want to be displayed. So good to go there. That's that's what it's gonna look like. Let's go ahead and start adding things that we're gonna want to use for all this stuff. So first of all, first and foremost. Let's go to the code. And there's going to be two areas where we're going to add things. Base game instance and game mode. So if you guys are not familiar with the series, this is episode 50. So we've been doing this for almost a year. And we do one every Sunday. So if you'd like to catch up or watch any of the prior videos, I'll go ahead and post an iCard in the top right corner that has a link to the very first fighting game tutorial episode. Otherwise, we can just get started, but essentially what I'm doing here, without needing to know about the fighting game, you can figure this out. We have a game mode and a game instance. So the game instance is persistent data. You can set it in a menu or in another level, and it will easily be transferred without having to pass data along manually. The game mode is only relevant for that game mode, of course, but it can be used for individual match data and information like that. So what I'm actually going to do is go into my .h for both my game mode and my game instance, and I'm going to make a few variables. In my game mode, I'm going to make something called round time. You can see my settings that I set here in new property. That's a float. Num rounds, which I make an integer, and is timer active, which I make a boolean. So round time and num rounds are easy. Round time is essentially how much time is in the round. Num rounds are how many rounds there are. Is timer active determines if the timer should be currently going down. So for example, uh, we don't want the timer to be going down during entrance animations, probably not when the victory animations are being played and things like that. Like that's all stuff we probably don't care about because we don't want to introduce any bugs by trying to implement t uh, timer logic while you know the game is either starting or ending. So it's better just to determine when we want to keep it active. It also allows us to control when it starts going down, which can look really good. When it says fight and you see the number drop, then it can look a lot more formal than it just going down the whole time. In your CPP for your game mode, go ahead and set your default values. These can be whatever you want. Uh, I would recommend is timer active be false by default since again, the entrance animations, but then num rounds and round time can be whatever. I put num rounds to three and round time to 99. I believe I mentioned it in the comment, but this num rounds can be either best of or must win that number. So we can go over both of those in this series. However, we're not gonna be covering that today. I'm just actually setting up the rounds. This is part one of a two part episode. This is gonna be part one setting everything up and then part two is actually gonna have us finish fights and go between rounds. Okay, so now let's go to our base game instance, dot H. Now, you can see I actually have the same two variables here. Is device for multiple players already exists, uh, if you're familiar with the series, but you're not going to need it today regardless. So just focus on these two. I have round time and num rounds again. And essentially, they're just copy and paste. I changed the category from game mode to game instance. And the reason I'm doing this, so the game mode variables are the ones I'm actually going to be pulling from and using at runtime. The game instance variables are ones we could set in options that could override the game mode variables if we want to. 
So in the game instance, I don't have a constructor, thus I don't set them to a default. But if we want to do this, what I would do is in an options menu, or some sort of settings menu, we can go ahead and set these values if we change like a round time box or a, a num rounds counter or something in those menus. We can go ahead and set them in the game instance. And then when you load your game mode, you can just override the uh, variables for round time and num rounds with the data in the game instance. So we're not gonna be using this today either because we don't even have an options menu, but this is just something I'm showing you now for a way you can do it. I will explain it later when we get an options menu. But okay, those are the most important parts. The fact that we have the round time, num rounds, and is timer active in the game mode. Fighter template character, I've gone ahead and included the base game instance as opposed to including it in our CPP class. So if you've been following the series, make sure to do it in this order. Make sure it's in your header file so we can use some data from there. And what I've done now is before we were using the game mode, getting player one and getting the character class from that. And actually that's fine everywhere we do that, but we don't want to do all that on the HUD. We don't want to have a reference to the HUD that has a reference to the game mode that has a reference to the characters. That's really backward to, to accomplish all that. So what we can do is include our base game instance because my base game instance is what has my E character class for P1 and P2, but better yet, it's also what actually has the E character class enum. So instead of making another E character class in the character or having it shared between the two, just by including the base game instance file, we can actually get access to this enum. So now in our character, we can go ahead and make a variable for that. So like we have e character state, we can actually make an e character class variable. And we can assign this variable based on the class that we are. That way we can show the proper name and image on the HUD. So here's how you create it. Now let's go into the CPP file for our character. You can see I set it with my character state and I set it to be default. Now default is gonna be mannequin in this case. Uh, and that's probably true. For your base character, you probably want the, the base character because otherwise you're going to be overridden by a class. For example, when I spawn in my mutant class, I actually have a mutant character. Now, basically, its logic is really bare because we're still setting up all the logic in our fighter class, our fighter template character. But we can do little things like this, and this is where you can really see the power of C++ and why it's useful. So I have this child of fighter template character right here called a mutant character. And everything is, is left alone, I haven't changed it. But in the CPP, in the constructor, I set the character class to be E mutant. It's the only variable I'm setting right now, but this differentiates it from the fighter template character. Anything that's in mutant character.cpp will override what's in fighter template characters.cpp if I am spawning a mutant character. So if I spawn you know, another class like the Vanguard, I don't even think I have a code class for him yet just because I haven't finished setting him up. But if I were to spawn one, then I would set his character class to be Vanguard. And then you can grab data from there. So this is just something I want to show you guys, a good method to access variables from your characters and change them based on the character that's being spawned. And then now we have this variable for our character, we can pass it directly to the HUD. And it'll be nice and easy. That's everything we're gonna be doing in the code. Let's go back over to Unreal and just adjust a few things. So first of all, I'm switching the name of character HUD to base game mode HUD. So if you previously had that, just understand this is the same thing. I've just added more to it and I felt character HUD was no longer the appropriate name. Now, I've also gone ahead and added a few things. I've added what I call P1 character image, P2 character image, mutant, mannequin, so what I call P1 name text and P2 name text, and this middle screen text. So I've added quite a few things. I've also made these smaller now so that they fit in between the uh, super meter bar and our character images. So quite a few changes have taken place. We're gonna go ahead and bind all these to different things. That way we know uh, what we wanna do here. So first of all, let's go to our event graph. We got quite a bit of logic that's going on here. Um, and I'll show you I'll show you what it is that we're doing. So in event construct on our HUD, let's go ahead and go to cast to the default game mode BP, or essentially we're going to cast to the game mode that we're gonna be using this HUD on. 
And the reason we want to do that is honestly in all these functions, and I actually have them here just so you can see. In uh, not p1 name text. And maybe I don't have any open. So in my get health bar percents, I was actually casting every single time. Same with the player two health bar percent. Same with super meter. Super meter two. We don't want to do that. We don't want to cast every time. What we need to do is just in our construct, go ahead and get a get your game mode, cast to the game mode that this HUD is going to be used on, and then set that to be the game mode reference. You can drag off of this and promote to variable like we like to do. So let's go ahead and go into the designer view. I just want to say I've anchored these things to make them look nice. I actually just put an episode out the Friday before this episode. I'll leave a link in the iCard in the top right corner right here to the anchoring episode if you want to deal with that and scaling your uh, widgets and items in your widget blueprint with your screen size. So what we need to do is make some bindings. So bindings, as you've seen in our HUD before and progress bars, they essentially determine, you know, per perhaps the percent that's filled in or the actual appearance of your bar, things like that. We're gonna, in this case, bind our images, our character one image and character two image, as well as our name texts. Let's go ahead and set that up. Go ahead and click on any of your P1 or P2 character image go down to appearance, brush, and hit bind and create binding. It'll automatically open once you do this. Now I have to find it because I have a lot open. And here we go, this is what I'm doing. So here's our binding, and then here's the logic. I go ahead and check if the game mode reference is valid or not. You don't always have to do this. It is a good rule of thumb, of course, to always check a reference if it's valid before using it. It's particularly good with appearance bindings appearance bindings for some reason just because of the flow of unreal seem to happen at the earliest compared to other bindings that i'm aware of okay so i go ahead and check if it's valid checking if it's valid won't hurt anyway so might as well do it and then i grab player one and i grab their character class since they now have this variable this is the one we added and we were setting in the constructor by the way make sure you build the solution and then compile in Unreal once you make those code changes so you can see all this stuff. And then I just do a switch on the character class and I determine what to pick from there. Now I do set up a character image array, which as it sounds is a slate brush array. So if you make a new variable, then click on the type, you can type in slate brush, this one right here, select this, and then you can click on the variable again, go over here to the variable type, click on it and change it from the pill to an array. So you can get a slate brush array. Then once you compile after you've made it, you'll be able to add values to your slate brush array. And once you've added them to your array, you can actually go ahead and select them. So go ahead and see where it says default value. You can hit plus as many times as you want for as many characters as you have. And then here are your indices. Just open them up and you'll be able to put an image. So I'm putting my character profile images my mannequin, my mutant, and my vanguard. It index 0, 1, and 2. So if it's mannequin, I'm using index 0 from this. Mutant, I'm using index 1. Vanguard, I'm using index 2. Now I will say, since we're doing this in a binding and it doesn't really ever have to update, you could be more efficient with it and just set it in the game. However, I have some ideas we might want to use that actually update it in the middle of a fight. So I'm going to leave it like this for now. Okay, and then player two character is literally the exact same logic except change player one to player two here. The rest is all the same. Okay, so I'm gonna close these out just to kinda get some space here. Now let's look at our name text, which I've also bound. So if we go to our name texts, you can see I've also bound them. I bound them under content text. Just click on bind plus create binding and then I'll automatically bring you here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do essentially the same thing, but we don't need any sort of array to choose the text. We can just hard code it here. I think that's perfectly acceptable since we know exactly where it's coming from and this data isn't going to be used elsewhere. However, feel free to make some sort of string array and use that if that makes you more comfortable. Um, 
I go ahead and get my game mode reference, player one, character class, just like before. I actually don't check if it's valid here. I probably really should, but I was actually leaving this unintentionally, uh, not checking intentionally because I wanted to show you that for some reason my images were being considered invalid if I didn't check the game mode, but the text wasn't. Doesn't mean this is what you should do. You pretty much always should check if there's a case or if there's a chance that it could be invalid, but I wanted to kind of show that off to you. Uh, this isn't the first time I've seen this happen, so I think it's worth mentioning. But, like I said, grab your character class, switch on it, and then I just put the name. To be honest, I put the exact name in the switch, but you could put whatever you want. And then same with player two, but of course I use player two. Okay. I'm going to get rid of that now. Okay, now there's one other thing we need to bind, and these other three functions are just going to be for the middle screen messages, so they're not too bad. Let's go ahead and make text for our round timer. So just go ahead and add text to the screen as usual. Boop. Just the same way you made the other text, I guess I should have shown that, but that's simple enough. And once you have text on here, you can make it say whatever you want. I made it say 99 so I can get the spacing down, but it doesn't really matter doesn't even have to say anything if you don't want it to. And then I've gone ahead and as usual, bind, create binding on the round timer. Go into my graph and get, and here is my binding. I get my game mode reference. I get the round time, which we made this episode. And then I truncate to text integer and then put it into the return node. So what's going on here? We have a float round time and we want it to be a float because we want the time to be pretty accurate. We want it to be seconds or close to seconds and we want to be able to speed it up or slow it down. If you have it as just an integer, you have to do this kind of weird, okay, either so many ticks, subtract one, or just on a certain update, subtract one. It gets more complicated than I feel is necessary. I feel if you just subtract from tick each time, subtract the delta time, and I'll show you what I'm talking about when we get there. Uh, and then force it to be an integer that is displayed that is much easier. It also, you can still speed it up and slow it down. So it's not really, there's no real harm in doing this that I can see. But basically, get your round time. You can drag off of this and just literally, whoops, you can literally type truncate like this. And when you truncate, and it, so it tells you well in this comment here, round A towards zero truncating the fractional part. So negative 1.6 becomes negative one and 1 1.6 becomes one. So essentially if this was 98.5, it would just become 98. Okay. Next, uh, we have two text. So this is just what's needed to get the integer into the text for the binding. This will all happen automatically if you try and bring the integer into the return node. So you don't have to manually do that if you don't want, but you do have to drag it in there. Okay, and those are all of our bindings taken care of. I'm gonna get rid of this so that I just have these. So, now that we have our HUD all set up with this stuff, we need to go ahead and make the middle screen text as well as figure out when we want to trigger all that logic to happen. So we need to go into our character's animation blueprint and basically this will work for any character. You just have to do it once their animations are done. If you don't like doing it in the animation blueprint, you could have a vent that fires when both the animations are complete and then uh, call that from somewhere like the game mode. I'm going to just use the logic that we had previously set up and call an event called trigger screen messages, which we are going to make in our HUD, which we already have a reference to because we set it to be visible and invisible at the current time. So just to kind of catch you up for those that aren't familiar, I basically have an entrance animation in our event graph. Um, sorry. That's the pre-entrance. And then I have this entrance animation. And you can see it just does this little roar. And it has a notify saying they have finished the entrance. So once we get to that point, uh, what we can do actually is we have it to where we call this event. And we make sure that both player one and player two are ready for their entrance. And if they are, then that means by the time this animation notify is fired, if both characters were already ready, to start their entrance. That means they're actually both finished with their entrance. No one else needs to play their entrance animation. Thus, we know that they were both done. So we set the camera back to default and we actually make the HUD reference go back to visible. 
Well, I also want to do a little bit of logic. I'm actually going to change up some stuff here, you'll see, with can move. And these will be bug fixes that I mentioned at the end. So you can ignore this Boolean and all of this logic with can move. And I'll show you why we do that later. The important part here is that we need our mutant character reference, cast it to our mutant character BP, and then get your HUD reference. And we're going to trigger our screen messages. So to be able to call this in your HUD, you need an event, of course, that you can actually call. So we can just do add custom event like this and call it whatever you want. I called mine trigger screen messages. And this is going to essentially go through all the logic that we want to display the uh, messages to the screen. So for starters, I'm gonna make three functions here. And I'm gonna make make ready text, make fight text, and hide middle text. So um, basically these two functions are the same with just a difference in what the text says. And then I have hide middle text which sets the text to be hidden. Um, so when we trigger the screen message off of the HUD, once both the entrances are done, then we call make ready text. Let's go into that. So we grab our middle screen text variable, which is this huge guy right here. And make sure if you don't have any of these things as, as variables and you need them, you just go up to their name and click is variable, check it, and you'll be good to go. Then if we look at this, I grab my text, I drag off of it and quite literally type set text, text, this one right here. And then I just hard code the text again. Uh, I make it ready in capital letters and then set it to be visible. By default, I believe I do actually leave it as visible. Let's see. I do just because the HUD is hidden before the characters are done with their entrance animations anyway. But feel free to make it invisible. We're going to make it visible here. And then I do a delay. I know often a delay is considered bad practice, but it's got some legitimate uses. For example, I actually want the ready to stay on the screen for a solid amount of time. Specifically here, I put it for a second. And uh, what I want after that is to hide the middle text and then make the fight text appear. This way it's like ready, fight, like in that order, not just like ready, fight. And also, I'm not allowing the characters to move until something called round start, essentially. And since they can't move, since we're forcing them to not really be able to move until then, it actually means these delays will also uh, delay that. They actually can't, they won't, they'll be able to move, but they won't be able to attack in that pre-phase. Okay. Uh, so then we call hide middle text, which is right here. And all I do is I grab the middle screen text and I set the visibility to be hidden. This one's simple. And then I call it make fight text, which is the last function in here. And I grab the middle screen text, I set the text to be fight, and then I set the visibility to be visible. Then I add another delay, and then I hide the middle text again. So it's ready, delay, hide, fight, delay, hide. And then we call something in the game mode called round start. And this is how we're gonna actually determine uh, when the timer is going to start going down. So if we go to round start, you can see we have some logic in here. Now let's go back to our animation blueprint and talk about what's going on here. Okay, so I was trying to get a feeling for what I wanted to do for the characters in the, the point in time where it says uh, ready and fight. So some games just lock you in place, say ready, fight, and then you go. Sometimes you can move around beforehand. I actually like that idea. So uh, to get started, after we set our HUD to be visible, I go ahead and set a Boolean that I make in the animation blueprint, both entrances finished, which I'm actually going to put with the other Booleans. And the only reason that this is useful, I'll show you where I use it, is this is an indicator to say, yes, we have finished both of our entrance animations. Now, sure, we have the logic here. Like, yes, we know if we're doing this logic, we finish both entrances. But there's some logic we, we're doing elsewhere that we don't necessarily want to do until they're both done. So specifically here, in where we clear our hitboxes and end our attacks. See, we set can combo to be false, has landed hit to be false. We clear our hitboxes. And then we set the player to can move. Well, that's good. Our player should be able to move once our hitboxes are clear. 
that means you know they're either done with their attack that they were doing and they can go back to their idle state it means that maybe they received damage but returned to idle from that take damage state so we want them to be able to move however we only want this to be the case if both entrances finished because some of these such as clear hitboxes occur on idle it's actually an animation that occurs on or it's a anim notify that plays during our idle animation and with that being said we don't want to be clearing the hitboxes and then we make the player or the characters be able to move on idle because that'll mean once their entrance animation is done they can move again so just for you who have been watching the series if you if you have this logic like i have it make sure you add this both entrances finished and only if it's true do the can move part of this logic it's a minor detail but it makes all the difference they'll be able to move early if you don't have this boolean in you could also extrapolate this data which just basically means to take it out and move it somewhere else and you could uh you could set this can move to be true somewhere else but i don't think i don't really consider this a hack because we do want the player to move whenever that we want them to be able to move when these and notifies fire we just don't want to in case they fire during the idle while our other player is using their entrance animation okay so that's just a minor detail again but pretty important depending on how you're setting it up and then once i have both of the once i trigger the screen messages and i have everything ready i go ahead and set both the player of this and notify and the other player to be able to move now it's important that i'm setting them both here because understand the way this logic works is one character will go in and say are both players ready for entrance so player one is ready for entrance at the start if you need to catch up on this entrance logic i'll leave a link in the icart to when, where we did character entrances so character one is ready for entrance and then we say false they're not both ready so then we go ahead and set player two ready for the entrance so then when player one and player two are ready only player two logic goes through this essentially now we didn't need player one and player two to be differentiated in this but if we're going to have them be able to move and not attack during the state then yes we need to set both player one and player two to be able to move and let me show you how that looks so if we go through our logic and i'm going to continuously set or pick just the mutants because he's the most fleshed out right now Okay, now I can actually walk and jump in that time prior to the fight. You can see me moving around in that. That's what we're doing there. That's what this is all set up for. Okay? So that should fix any issues with that. And uh, just one other quick fix for that. If you are doing it this way, you may want to remove the can move and notify from your entrance sequence to idle. Simply because can move that uh, transition event that you call that we have i was calling that and i realized if i call that here see this is what it does and then it'll force can move to be true early on and the reason for this is the the characters are actually they finish their entrance animation they go to idle now we can't see them because the the camera goes to like player two or you know player one whatever order you do it in but it goes to the other character the second character to be using their entrance animation so the first character that used their entrance animation goes to their idle state afterward that's why we have to be careful with this stuff so go ahead and make sure that on your entrance to idle you don't have any events or at least you don't set can move to be true in them and now we can resume with the rest of the video okay so uh, at this point, all we need to do is determine how our round timer is going to go down, how much it's going to go down by, and if the players can attack or not, if we want to change that. Um, so I, I actually forgot to mention this in the code at the beginning, but it's not going to hurt too much. So go back into your code, and if you want the characters to be able to move but not attack during the ready fight text, then we can go ahead and set that up now. Just go into your fighter template character, make another boolean, called can attack i put it right next to can move in the fighter template character.cpp in the constructor if i could find it make sure your can attack is false by default if you don't want them to be able to attack while the entrance is up okay then 
instead of adding a bunch of logic to our state machines, because I know that's probably the intuitive option, it's definitely what I thought of first when I was making this episode, a much, much easier option is to just do an if check anywhere where this would apply. So in our code, I gotta scroll down, don't wanna miss any. Everywhere we would call our start attack, start attack one, we check if can attack, which basically just means if can attack is true. Then start attack two, start attack three, start attack four, start exceptional attack. And you should do this with throws and stuff too, um, if you haven't already. But for me, start attack three is actually my throw just because I was lazy and didn't want to make a new one since I only had uh, three attacks anyway. My light, medium, super. So my throw is kind of like my heavy. But make sure you, you put in those checks to see if can attack is true or not. So he won't, you know, none of the attacks will be able to be true because none of the booleans will be set and thus the, anim the animation blueprint won't take any of the states. On top of that, we need to just go ahead and uh, have a point where we can set those to be true. So if we go into our default game mode BP, I have this thing called round start. So round start is, as it sounds, it's what basically <laughs> starts the round. So we need to make sure player one and player two can start uh, attacking when the round begins. And we also need to make sure that the timer starts ticking when the round begins. So remember, this round start event is being called from our base game mode HUD. We use our game mode reference that we set in the construct and just call round start. And as usual, to get this event, add custom event. Okay, so make sure you grab player one and two, can attack is true. Set is timer acted to be true. Then in tick, we're gonna go ahead and determine our round time logic. So when you have the event tick, and if it's not in your game mode by default or you got uh, rid of it, you can just search for it again. It has something called delta seconds, which is essentially how much time has passed since the last tick. So this is an accurate way of uh, taking away time or value at a consistent rate. So what we want to do is check if the timer is active, literally get our is timer active and do a branch. If it is active, then we want to decrement from it. But we want to make sure that the time would be above zero because we could also, first of all, we could clamp the round time to be zero at the le at, at the lowest point. But if we uh, check to see if round time is greater than or equal to zero and it returns false, not only can we do it basically a forced clamp and set it to 0, 0.0, but we can also use this as a method to call our next function, which will be end round or something to that effect. Uh, that's what we're going to be doing in the next episode. That's what we're going to be continuing on. But this is the logic setup. That's where we're going to go from here. So we get our round time. You should just round time. Simple enough. Get it. Subtract. So the minus sign, float minus float. Drag in delta seconds. Then drag off of the return node of this and check greater than or equal to zero because we want to make sure that if it is greater than zero, like even if it's one, then that's fine. We want it to still be active. We still want the round to be going. But as soon as it's less than zero, then we don't want it to still be going. So if it's 0 0.1, we still want it to be going. But once it hits zero, we're good. So then we branch. And I'm going to delete this now because you can see it up above. But that's how you string all this stuff together. So if it's true that it's greater than or equal to zero, then we just set the round time to the result of round time minus the delta seconds. See? But if it's false, we force round time to be zero. So that way it's not less than zero. And we are also going to, again, do like, oh, start end round. We're going to have an end round event and perform the logic there. You could also go ahead and set the is timer acted to be false here. So that's pretty much it guys. That's how you can go into your game and have a round timer, have a working HUD, have a round system, because we have three rounds. Sure, we don't have a win condition yet. That's what next week's episode is all about. Either time running out or the enemy being depleted of their health, but that will be done soon. <laughs> we will cover uh, best of or must win. So if you have to win three matches in a row or if it's best of three, then you only have to win two. And we're also going to have a little icon next to our names, like three little dots or something that get filled in. That way we know when we're winning matches and who's won how many. But uh, lastly, guys, if we do this one more time, I wanted to show you, just because I don't think I really showed it off, 
we can, uh, I'll show you, we can actually not attack at the, at the start here. It just won't register attack. We can move as much as we want, but as soon as the fight goes away, then we can attack. And you can hear all that spamming. So there you go, guys. That's how we can have our round timer with our appropriate before round logic. So, like I said, we'll start part two next week, and we'll be golden. So thank you guys so much for watching. If this episode helped you, please subscribe. It does more for the channel than anything else you can do, and I just really appreciate it. it lets me know that I'm doing a good job and that uh, I'm helping you make the videos you want to see. If you did have any issues with this episode or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord. I'll be happy to help you. There's a link in the description. I want to give a huge shout out to all my YouTube membership subscribers and supporters and all my Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for believing in me and giving me support. I will go ahead and post the link in the description here to show you all the benefits if you're interested in joining and supporting the channel so I can continue to make videos like this. Lastly, guys... If you want to come join us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash the 27 I've got a new series we're going to be starting. Well, at the time you're watching this, we actually already will have started it on Man of Badan, and it'll be fun. It's a co-op stream. Otherwise, you can come see me fail at Demon Souls and complain about how boring it is sometimes. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.